Hello, my name is Daniel Garza. I'm the president of the Libre Initiative, and we are very thankful and grateful for that you could join us today. Uh, we um, are always glad to bring to you uh, content uh, of where we discuss important ideas, uh, where we educate and inform on issues that are impacting us every day on how um, public policy really is impacting society. And then when you get down to a very granular level, uh, how public policy impacts individuals. Um, and so nothing could be more important, I think, in our lives uh, when we consider uh, how much uh, policy, right, is, is, is being generated from the federal government, state governments, local governments, county governments, uh, just about at, at every level. So um, I wanted to talk to you about uh, today um, was defining the proper role of government in a free society. Uh, a, a very important topic um, for us, um, in my judgment, uh, socialism is, is the big lie of the 20th century. Its proponents will tell you uh, that it promises prosperity, uh, equality, and in a very real way, uh, they think security. Uh, but it has only delivered poverty, scarcity, misery, and really tyranny, uh, if we're talking about security every time that it is tried. And it ignores the incentives. It requires coercion, especially by all powerful government. And it has, and it's based on uh, distorted notions of human behavior. I have an exceptional uh, guest to help us talk through this. Um, and I'm gonna uh, also, uh, before I, I get into the introduction, uh, just let you know um, that you can, uh, hear the translated portion of of, uh, of this topic, of this discussion, um, if, if you um, click on the link. And so if, if uh, you want to understand it better in, in a native tongue like Spanish, uh, then there is that tool for you as well. Um, so let me get to the introduction. Uh, Stephanie Meyer is a, a, politi a, a political democracy and media educator of 20 years with work spanning 13 countries. Stephanie's training, uh, trainings have included expanding democracy and free market economies overseas, as well as work in, in campaign management and grassroots advocacy, both in Florida and in Georgia. Her work has empowered people across the globe and has been published in English in Russian, in Tajik, and Arabic. Stephanie is currently Director of Youth and Special Programs at Americans for Prosperity, where she educates people about the principles of equal rights and mutual uh, benefits in, in society. Uh, welcome to this broadcast, Stephanie. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having Absolutely. me. It's an honor to have you. Um, so let's get to it. Um, and I'll also uh, let the folks know that we're going to have a question and answer period after our uh, discussion, um, St uh, Stephanie. So uh, if, if uh, what we are talking about and, and, and if uh, Stephanie's answers are, oh, you know, provoking some, some other questions, by all means, uh, jot them down and, and we'll, we'll want to address them after um, our, our cursory conversation. So um, the, the first primary basic question, Stephanie, is what is the role of government? And, and I want to ask it in two parts. One is in a communist country, and then what is the role of government in a free society? So let's take uh, the first crack at that. What is the role of government in a communist country? Yes. Yeah, so um, I thought it might be good since you have uh, you do these shows and you were talking about socialism and communism in previous episodes that we just revisit the definition. Some people like a definition. So uh, socialism, so we'll break down both socialism and communism. Socialism is an economic theory that advocates for the means of production, distribution and exchange, and that it's owned by the community as a whole. Um, this, as you mentioned in your introduction, it requires coercion by government. So that's really the only authority that a government has. And, and this word might sound charged, coercion, but it's really true. The only way that uh, a society of laws works is if you voluntarily agree or if the government forces you through penalties or fines or jail time. And in countries where there has been tyranny, it can even be worse than that. Um, so it does require coercion. Now, communism takes this a step further. It was developed by Karl Marx. 
And there's no private ownership in the concept of communism. In this economic and political system, um, you're trading your time uh, and services for money and creating the path that you want with the value or the skills that you have is not something that is a value in communist society. The needs of the individual are outweighed by the needs of the many. And this is a, a, a really stark, stark uh, departure from what our founders put together. And really, I think today it's very difficult for most of us who are living in the United States of America, especially for any length of time, to really fully appreciate just how miraculous uh, this experiment of the United States Constitution is. Because we're the heir of, of uh, we've inherited freedoms that it's easy to take for granted. So, so the, this idea of socialism and communism is a very top-down, centralized, authoritarian government that says, and it's funny because it's through the, the guise of compassion mm -hmm. that it, the idea is sold to say, we at this particular top level, the federal level, will take care of everyone equally. So we will centralize power We'll centralize laws. Uh, we will dictate where supply and demand is needed. And we will make the decisions for the economy and for your life. Um, and so this is a top-down approach that's completely the opposite of, of the approach of a free society. And so when we talk about that great experiment um, uh, about the role of government in a free society, um, that, that rights are interdependent, that they're indivisible, that they're alienable. <laughs> my Spanish is better than my English sometimes, uh, alienable. Um, how does that benefit us uh, to have freedom in a free society and how does that operate? Well, the interesting thing is with, when you, just to take one step back, when you think about uh, communism or socialism or even uh, monarchies, uh, theocracies, any kind of government that has existed in the history of mankind has not taken into account the dignity of the individual, okay? And they also don't take into account human nature. So our founders were very wise. When they wrote the De Declaration of Independence and when they wrote the Constitution, they understood human nature. Um, and so this really played a strong role. Thomas Jefferson actually said, if, if, all, if, if, mankind, if all mankind were angels, then we wouldn't need government. And if, if government was run by angels, then we wouldn't actually need any laws, right? Uh, we wouldn't need anyone to watch the government. So, and then he even further asked, who are these angels among us who are gonna make all the rules and organize society, right? So part of the understanding, our founders had the understanding that Yes, people are capable of extraordinary things if you allow them the freedom to pursue their best interests and create value. But human nature also tells us that there is corruption in the world. There is um, that darker side. And so the best idea is not to have power centralized in the hands of a very small number of people who are making decisions for the masses. You want to decentralize power. So when we get back to this idea of what is the proper role of government in a free society like ours, is it's really actually four simple words. Do you know what they are? I'll tell you what they are. <laughs> I won't hold you in suspense. <laughs> you secure your rights to secure your rights. It's, it's really that simple. And that's what makes it so wonderful is, is this idea in the Declaration of Independence that we're born, as you said, with inalienable rights. These are rights that from the moment of birth, you have these rights. They were given to you by your creator and, and by virtue of being alive, they're yours. No one can give them to you and no one can take them away. 
Those are called negative rights, actually, because our government was written, our constitution was written in such a way that it's really a series of negative rights. It's, a, it's government codifying in writing to say, these are the things that we cannot take away from you because you already have these rights. So if, if the role of government in a free society isn't to give you your rights, and keep in mind, if you live in a country where the government is defining your rights and they're giving you your rights, then they can also take away your rights. That's right. It's really more like the role of a parent, right? Mm -hmm. As parents, we, you know, our children don't have complete freedom. We are giving them their rights and allowing them to, to learn, right? But we can take those rights away. So positive rights are where you're, you're giving someone rights. Our constitution is created around negative rights. And this is really important because negative rights is what protects you. So if you say, well, Okay, if the role of government isn't to give you your rights, then what is the role of government? To secure those rights, and what does that mean? That means to remove barriers to you exercising your inalienable rights. So barriers that would keep me from speaking freely, barriers that would keep me from life, right? If, I, if my life is threatened, that's a barrier. There are laws to protect me from that because I have a right to life. I have a right to pursue happiness. So there are barriers in my way. The government should be clearing the field, not cluttering the field with excessive laws and regulations, which is a little bit maybe of a further down the conversation. But, but really that's the essence of of what a free society, the role of government is in a free society is to secure the rights that you already have. Thank you so much, Stephanie. That's uh, really powerful. I, I really love the concept uh, of securing the rights. Um, and you know, obviously those rights that are expressed in our Bill of Rights and the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and those founding charters are a treasure and are transcendent and and derechos inalienables, right? <laughs> Thank you so much for saying it correctly. But uh, even today, uh, still, those rights are under threat. And so where are we seeing this tendency towards um, socialist ideas in policies today? Uh, can, can you give us some examples and, and, and how this is dangerous for a free society? Yeah, I think really where we're seeing the dangers of socialist ideas and policies encroaching into our into our country, into our lives, is in two different sections. One is policy and one is cultural. And, and I think both of these things are happening um, and, and they're things we need to be aware of and, and address in different ways. Uh, Policy-wise, there's two things to think about. One is there are policies that we've seen um, being implemented over the years. We can look at, for example, uh, going even back as far back as the, the Clinton administration, when Hillary Clinton was trying to push for uh, socialized medicine, right? At the time, the public wasn't ready for that, and that was not successful. Then when you come forward to the Obama administration, then of course we saw the Affordable Care Act, this was a time where the country was, was more open to this idea because this idea had been discussed for years and years and years. So socialized medicine is just one example, right? Of, of, a, of a centralized top-down policy. And if you think about it, um, I'll give you an example of why that doesn't work because it's always guised in the, in the uh, it's cloaked in fairness, right? Uh, everyone will have the same opportunities and access and, and everything will be affordable. And it's a very utopian kind of sales pitch. Um, but in truth, if you really look and taking healthcare as an example, if you look at um, medical costs, mm -hmm. we don't know what the cost of any medical service really is, right? Even when we walk into our doctor, they can't tell you. Uh, it has to be submitted to insurance and go through a lot of bureaucratic hoops and then it's later spit out with some price that we've already now obligated ourselves to. Um, it's unlike any other product in, in a free market, quite frankly, right? Where, you're, where it's understandable and reasonable to know the price that you're going to pay for it so you can make the best choices for you and your family. 
So, so that's one in socialized medicine. We don't, we don't know the prices. Um, and we also aren't able to, to innovate the way that you would in a private sector. If you look at medicine and science, some of the quickest innovations have come in the parts of medicine and healthcare that are not traditionally covered by insurance, mm. right? So LASIK eye surgery is a good one. Uh, LASIK eye surgery, when this first came onto the scene, you know, where you can correct your vision, uh, that wasn't considered an absolute necessity to health. So most insurance companies wouldn't automatically cover that under a typical program. So people had to pay a lot for it. Well, this put it into the free market. Uh, different, different doctors were innovating. They were looking for ways to do it better and more affordable. And you saw in a very short amount of time, the technology of LASIK eye surgery improved dramatically and the price came dramatically down. But yet that wasn't part of this socialized program. While the healthcare services in, this, in a more socialized and centralized program continue to be extraordinarily high and difficult to access. So that's just one example. And now today, one of the, one of the big issues that is being talked about in our country is HR1, this bill that is, is really going to fundamentally change the way our elections are run. There are aspects of this bill that affect speech, free speech. Um, and, and this is just another example of where policy can encroach into our freedoms and our everyday lives. Now, there's another part of that, if I can just um, talk about the cultural aspect briefly. Mm -hmm. The cultural aspect is very important too, because socialism, as I said, is always getting uh, sold as a very compassionate idea. And it does sound compassionate. I know you guys have talked about this in previous um, shows where it doesn't it sound great that we are all equal and we're all the same and we have an evil even playing field. We've seen throughout history that's not how socialism plays out. And I know you guys have talked about that before, so I won't I won't go too much into that. But our country has been incrementally getting used to this idea of hearing socialism as a as a good thing. We put the word democratic in front of socialism and that makes it sound better. Um, but if you look at the brief history of, of, of even modern United States, going back to the early 20th century, Herbert Marcuse, who was a Marxist from Germany, he was uh, a part of the Frankfurt School. They came and settled in America during World War II and did their research in Columbia University. Herbert Marcuse and his colleagues at the Frankfurt School understood very well well, and they were very open about this idea. This is not a secret or something that I'm, you know, coming up with. Uh, Herbert Marcuse talked and published these ideas a lot that they were very interested in the idea of psychology and mm. influencing culture because they knew the failure of Marxism was that the cultural, or sorry, the revolution from the, the masses, from the proletariat didn't happen. So they understood, okay, we cannot dismantle democracy with an overthrow or with a violent revolution. We have to insert our ideas into the culture. They called this the long, slow march through the institutions. And this is why we see so much socialist ideology in uh, our movies, our, our films, our entertainment, our school system a lot of times has this. Um, you see this a lot in our, in our culture and people have said to me before, where did this come from? Yeah. Well, it was, it was deliberately being uh, tried for a very long time. And, and I just wanna mention this one quote by Herbert Marcuse yeah. because I think it was so telling. Um, he said in an interview in the seventies, uh, he said, my colleagues at the Frankfurt School and I were interested to know the degree to which we could use psychology to manipulate, manage, and control not only the conscious mind, but the subconscious mind. Mm. That's a quote. I never oh. forgot it. Yeah. So, so we have two issues right now in our country 
uh, to your question, which is uh, we have policy that is increasingly becoming top down from the federal government. And we have culture, we have a culture uh, issue. And, and to the policy piece, you know, one of the things that we like to say a, a lot, my colleagues and I, is what if government didn't do that? You know, you, you want to think about is coercion, which is the, the only role that government has, that's the only power government has, right? So keeping that in mind, is coercion the best and only way to address whatever the issue is that we're talking about? So if it's something like, you know, um, making treaties or printing money or, or managing a military, you may make an argument that yes, mm -hmm. we need a federal government to do that. We shouldn't have all the states with their own military. But if it's something like building a library or deciding what child needs a certain program in a local school, these kinds of things are better off being decentralized to where we have the best ideas at local levels and not at the unknown, unseen, you know, Washington bureaucrats who we don't even get to elect. Yeah, and that's, and that's always been a personal fear of mine, right? That we centralize so much power and so much control and money in the hands of politicians or bureaucrats um, that as has been said, uh, as, as that power and that control and that money grows in the federal government, there's a proportionate diminishment of that power and control to the individual, right? Because it's drawing it from the individual. And of course, it's being used against you through coercive means to get you to comply. And even, I, you know, I've always thought like things like work mandates, heavy taxation, heavy regulation is also a form of power that has been amassed and is now being imposed on individuals and is really hindering freedom, free, hindering the liberty of the individual to do with his treasure, you know, what he wants and, you know, to fulfill your own aspirations instead of the aspirations of a, of a politician, right? And so, and so what, one of the models that they point to as a successful one, because they always say, well, yeah, you know, um, it's been tried, but it's never been tried the way, you know, socialism is supposed to work. It works well in Scandinavian countries. So can you, can you talk to us about that? Are, are Scandinavian countries socialist? And can you explain the economic and political models? That is a great point that you bring up. I hear this all the time. Um, and understandably, because this is something that we hear in our media and, and from many experts is that, oh, well, you know, um, we should all be like Denmark, right? <laughs> right? Well, it's actually, it's a complete falsehood that Scandinavian countries are socialist. They don't have socialist economies. What they have is they have free market economies. So countries like, you know, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, these Scandinavian countries are free market economies. And the way that they pay for large socialist systems is through a high tax rate. But they're free market. As a matter of fact, um, uh, Life in Norway is a website and they did an article recently. I just came across it not too long ago. And mm -hmm. it said, Scandinavian countries are not by any reasonable definition socialist. Mm -hmm. They're still trying to um, correct this false narrative. So the other thing too, that's really interesting about that to me is number one, so they don't have socialist economies, there's that, right? So that's just a fact. So, so there's no reason to compare them and say, we should follow this socialist model. It's a misnomer. However, even if you were mistakenly thinking that, <laughs> these countries are completely different animals than the United States of America. Mm -hmm. As of this month today in 20 in march of 2021 denmark has a population of 5.8 million people if you took the state of massachusetts and doubled it two states of massachusetts denmark would fit inside this and inside that space with room to spare okay mm. the entire country norway in 2020 had a population of 5.4 million people and they would fit, you could fit all of Norway inside the state of California. 
It's about 80% the size of the state of California. And both of these countries, and, and even Sweden, other, other Scandinavian countries, are highly homogenous, meaning they are, I think, uh, what is it? Denmark is 91, almost 92% white there's almost no people of color in denmark so this is a, a a very singular population with a singular common culture and and very small in terms of square uh, miles and and population the united states now when you look at our country we are a big family we are 30 times bigger than norway 30 times Okay, we have 331 million people as of last year. So comparing the needs of these very small homogenous states with the United States, uh, large, diverse, uh, an array of cultures, an array of people and economies and interests with a lot of different needs. And when you have a lot of different needs, you need a lot of different solutions, which is only met by free markets and innovation. Yeah, it's like comparing uh, bowling balls and apples, right? <laughs> <laughs> really, yeah. Well, yeah. So, so in all of this, um, you know, um, obviously government has its merits, right? And so how does government uh, in its proper place, by the way, uh, empower community driven solutions? Yeah, so, so this is important because you're right. I mean, we spend a lot of time beating up on government, <laughs> uh, but we do need it, right? We do. And, and not to forget too, government is not only federal. There's, we have a structure through states and federalism, which is the idea that states have rights, right? We have a 10th amendment in our constitution that talks about this idea that whatever powers are not specifically delegated, you know, articulated in the constitution, then are reverted to the power in the states. And this is, this is by design giving us more choice. Right now we have 50 states, you have 50 different governors, you have 50 different state governments from the state level all the way to your local school board and your, uh, I'm from Florida, mosquito control, that's a very important one. Uh, <laughs> all these different parts of government have a role to play. So the best way to think about this is through what we call key institutions, okay? So imagine you have, you have basically four main key institutions. You have government, that's an institution. You have business and private, yes. private businesses, right? Private enterprise. You have communities mm -hmm. and you have education. These are, these are really important institutions that help our society to be organized, to run, to make sense, and allow all of us to do what we need to do, okay? When you have any one institution, and in this case, government, get bigger than the other institutions. So, you know, if one is getting bigger, what's happening to the other ones? They're going to atrophy. And this is something culturally that our country is, is really struggling with right now, quite frankly, because community, which involves family, charitable organizations, you know, knowing your neighbor, it involves churches. It's, it's all the things that, that help us interact with one another on a personal level and, and help each other. Community has increasingly been replaced with government regulations and government programs and government mm. policy, right? So if I know, for example, that there's a huge welfare state, am I going to worry about my neighbor as much if I know, well, you know, the government will take care of it. That's right. I know a lot of people, and, and this is just one example from my own life, um, the, school in, the schools in our school district, I have two children, the schools in our school district made an announcement a couple of years ago that uh, breakfasts and lunches would now be free and available to all students. Well, there are certainly families who need that. And, the, and that's why this program is important, right? That some kids get their, their best meals while well they're at school. But I didn't celebrate with joy the way a lot of my uh, friends who have children did. And the reason why is because I said, this is yet another thing that families 
were responsible for, that we took it upon ourselves as parents to provide a meal in the morning for our child, send them out into, out into the world. Um, and yet now that's another meal that we are, another thing that we're giving over to the government to say, you feed my child. So the point of these examples is really to say, when one institution like government gets too big, it, it really just, it atrophies the other institutions and makes it more difficult. The ideal situation well, is when these institutions are balanced. Yeah, well, and, and, and let's let's delve a little further into that and, and, and something else that is a, of a similar character to what you were talking about with the school, school lunches. Um, the pandemic, right, has brought uh, about a greater reliance on the federal government and you've seen it mobilize uh, to the satisfaction of some and to, you know, not so satisfied with others, right, in, 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 in its scope. Um, it, in terms of relief, it, it has mobilized, right? And how, how is this different from socialism to have a federal government move on a massive scale like that and maybe crowd out what you're talking about, a lot of the things that we do as um, neighbors and our churches and, you know, third party organizations. Right. You know, this is such an, this is such a great question, um, Daniel, and, and I, and an important one, because on the one hand, uh, we've all been locked down and a lot of businesses have gone uh, under generations sometimes of families who've worked a business and couldn't make it through the lockdowns. On the other hand, we've also seen incredible innovation um, by people who are in a position to, you know, create new kinds of masks when they were needed and, and stop creating whatever other thing they were manufacturing, right? Um, there, there's just been a lot of this innovation. So I think to the pandemic, the important thing to keep in mind is there is a difference between top-down federal centralized planning as a way of life versus government power during emergencies and crises, right? Mm. So in this particular case, think when there is an emergency and the government has to step in, whether it's federal or whether it's state, governments have to do this when there's a hurricane, right? Again, I'm from Florida, so <laughs> these are the examples <laughs> near and dear to me. Um, but you know, they have to step in and they'll impose curfews and all kinds of things, right? Uh, during that time that, that may or may not be the right decision, but this is the power that they have. Well, the important thing to remember is the during a crisis, it should be targeted. Government intervention should be targeted, timely and temporary, right? Correct. These yes. three things to me are the litmus test for is government acting in its proper role in this case? The pandemic is difficult because we weren't familiar with this before. It was a new virus. So yes, you had to wait for science and the medical community, then the virus evolves. So there may be new information, right? But the, the government should always be erring on the side of the least amount of coercion possible to address the situation at hand and no more people will naturally then take initiative themselves to fill in for community, for neighbors, to help mm -hmm. one another. It's when we start to be conditioned that government will take care of it, that we run into this danger of having too much socialized government, too much top-down planning, and not enough bottom-up solutions. Because the best solutions to most of the problems in our country really do come most of the problems in life quite frankly really do come from us people living life that's and right. understanding what's needed in a particular problem yeah no, that's, that's exactly right look um speaking towards that you know at the leave it initiative you know we we noticed early on when we were doing advocacy of free market ideas and economic freedom principles uh, that they would tell us, well, I don't have a driver's license. I mean, how do I get a job? You know, I, I don't know English. Um, it's tough for me to get a job. Um, I don't have a high school diploma. So the opportunities ain't opened up to me in the marketplace like they are to others. There is no equal opportunity. So we, and we were talking about access to the marketplace needed to be opened up. So we, we rolled up our sleeves and got involved and started doing 
these seminars and these sessions, right, where we would bring in folks at no cost to them and not one penny from the, you know, a federal or state or local governments to do this. Um, and, and neighbors helping neighbors to remove those barriers so that we could have access to the marketplace, right? Better opportunity. How, what exactly, um, and you alluded to this a little bit, but I, I want you to get a little bit more into this as we, as we start to draw down this conversation. What exactly are bottom up solutions? And how can we implement them? Yes. So your organization, the Libre Initiative is a, is a living example of how you can implement them. Because think about this. You're not saying to people, oh, you know what? You don't have a driver's license. You don't speak the language. It's too hard for you. So you know what? We'll take care of it. Okay? You just sit tight. We will send you help. You don't try it. It's not fair. You shouldn't be worried. You give them hope. You give them awareness of their dignity. You give them that light to say, you have everything in you that you need. Right. What is stopping you are these external barriers. Exactly. And that is something that people together can work to remove right. and change. Ideally, what, that's why we all want to be unified in holding our elected officials accountable for keeping government as limited as it possibly can be. Uh, I saw a, a politician, I'll just say a politician, um, I think it was two years ago, who was giving a speech for their election and saying they were so proud that they had passed, uh, they had introduced more bills than any of their colleagues that session. And I mm -hmm. thought that shouldn't be something that you're proud of. It's not a rate, a contest of so who can create the most new laws. So the bottom up solutions is exactly what your initiative, Libre Initiative is doing is, is connecting people to actual real people who can then talk about barriers and help one another to remove them. Yeah, I, I think well, one of the beautiful things about it, you know, when you see the light come on, uh, for folks is all of a sudden the free market becomes real to them, right? And and they embrace it and then they, they thrive in it um, because they are capable of extraordinary things like you're talking about. We, we just obviously need to work together to remove those barriers, as you were saying. Um, the last question I'll, I'll ask you, Stephanie, is uh, the Libre Institute, um, who is hold, uh, hosting this conversation, uh, our slogan is freedom drives progress, uh, which I think is a great, one of the all-time great slogans ever. <laughs> How can we be sure uh, that freedom results in in greater prosperity, in justice, and equality, and it's and and it's there is no exploitation. Well, you can't regulate anyone into prosperity. First of all, no mm -hmm. no one has ever done it in the history of mankind, and no one ever will. So that's the first thing. I think. The biggest, most important thing is, is to remember this idea that, you know, going back to the beginning of our conversation, when we talk about centralized planning and socialism, there is not a compassionate pathway. Although there, it's sold as compassion, it's not. Free market economies, free societies, competition, all of these things we're talking about, removing barriers for people, communities working together, families working together. These are all positive things that build people up. Right. And actually it really, it's, you know, it's almost like to use a, maybe this is a, sounds like a funny analogy, but it's just, it reminds me of, of training when I was to helping my child, my children, both of them learning to ride a bike. You know, you hold on to the bicycle and you're behind them, but you let it go and they don't even know you let go and they're doing it on their own. And that's, right. I think, how we all are. We're all mm -hmm. like that. And so, yes, all of us, everyone has some barrier, a challenge, maybe lots of challenges. And, and that is not fair. The thing that you, you accept in a free society is you accept risk for the payoff of being able to be the architect of your own destiny. And that is the most compassionate thing you could possibly have. So I think this idea, um, we have to build up these other institutions 
so that we aren't uh, forgetting people who are truly victims, who are exploited, who do need help, because that is part of our society. We're a big family and we're gonna have 330 million people. We're going to have challenges. That's why these other institutions are important and they need to be balanced with the proper, with with government in its proper place. Yeah, I've I've always preferred that we work to redistribute knowledge and equal opportunity than to redistribute somebody else's earned wealth. I think we do much better with with the former than the latter. Um, With that, I'm now, I hope this conversation has also spurred uh, or do some questions uh, for a lot of folks that are listening in. And I'm going to toss it over to Yvette Diaz, who is going to handle the question and answer portion uh, of this conversation before we wrap it up. Thank you so much, you guys. This has been a very tremendous conversation, a foundational conversation. Um, and one of the questions that we have is, what are some of the warning signs about the way that policy can start leaning towards more of a socialist philosophy. Um, sometimes it's easier on the national level, but maybe on the local level, what are some of the things that, that are started creeping towards more socialistic perspective? I think one of the things is to really go back to this idea of what if government didn't do that, right? So part of the, the, the default conversation in, in our federal government has been for a very long time, um we have a problem right so how do we solve it the left thinks we should solve it this way and the right thinks we should solve it this way but everyone seems to already be bought into the idea that government should solve it that's the first place we need to back up and start and say whenever there is a problem or a challenge an issue in our society whether it's a big federal sized issue or whether it's a local issue We should say, okay, first and foremost, what if government didn't do that? Is there a solution from right here within our community that might be better or a local government or some sort of initiative from a private business? There's so many solutions and the best solutions have almost always, I think, I'll be fair and say almost always, I wanna say always, But I'll be fair and say, I think the best solutions to society's problems have always come or almost always from people, from from people working together. So these other institutions and not from government bureaucrats. So we really need to, to challenge ourselves at the local level when there are local regulations being put into our our county, our city, our schools, our parks, all these different areas. We need to challenge those. And we need to make sure that they're in line with government's role of just simply securing the rights of the people within that area and that they're not encroaching on an area that businesses should be working in or families and communities should be working in. If I, if I could add to that, I also I look to policy champions, right, who, whose first instinct <laughs> is to resist regulation, to resist heavier taxation. And that the instinct should always be to decentralize, right? Uh, and to empower the individual in, in, in policy making decisions. And those narratives that, that, that they are expressing uh, honor that, right? Uh, as opposed to that the first thing you think of is how can government help? How can we bring in more government you know, and more regulation, more tax you know, to, to, to uh, remedy the situation? Um, we need to begin to support policy champions that are going to uh, decentralize the federal government and state and local governments to a certain uh, level too. Awesome. Another question we got was, one of the biggest problems in Latin America is corruption at governmental level. What is the relationship between corruption and big government? Is this for either one of us? I don't want to interrupt Daniel. Um, Yes, go ahead, Stephanie. Sorry, I didn't address that. (laughs) <laughs> Sorry. The relationship between corruption and big government, was that the question? Yeah, well, uh, this is not a new idea, right? This is why Thomas Jefferson said what he said about angels and, and government. Um, you know, we do need to pay close attention, I think, starting from the local level all the way up to the federal of who our candidates are and what their policies are, informing ourselves and being a lot more Uh, demanding that they respect and understand and honor the Constitution. 
That's what they're sworn to uphold. But what's happening is at our federal level, we have, yes, we have this beautiful constitution. We also have a very vast, enormous, centralized government bureaucracy that is run by unelected officials. And this is something that people don't talk about a lot. Um, I think it's, it's not a water cooler topic. We talk about government as this, you know, just the government. But there is a, a, a regulatory part of the government where the people who are creating regulations have enormous power over your life. The IRS is a regulatory agency. You know, the Environmental Protection Agency is a regulatory body. These are people who have power to make rules that command your business conduct, your personal conduct, the taxes you pay. Um, and it's an, a very important, but they're not elected, so it's difficult to hold them accountable. And I think that's where human nature can also come in. And we have to really monitor the growth of regulatory bodies and make sure that we are keeping government as small as possible. Um, I would add um, one of the most corrupt agencies in Mexico, we're talking about uh, Latin America, uh, for the longest time, it's just starting to get cleaned up, but not really, uh, was Pemex, um, Petróleos Mexicanos. They, um, Lázaro Cárdenas, after the revolution, nationalized oil and basically under the guise of nuestro patrimonio nacional, you know, our national patrimony um, was the energy, you know, that was found in, in, in the natural resources. Um, but there is this elite cadre of bureaucrats who are all powerful, who get to decide contracts and expropriation of lands and minerals. Uh, and they wield massive power and massive wealth, these individuals with their you know, high salaries. And it's be it became very, very corrupt. Today, it's going under. They need private um, investment. And Mexicans, unfortunately, pay twice as much for gas at the pump than uh, those of us in, in, in America where we have free market system that controls that. Yeah, and if I may say one more thing on that too, because you're absolutely right. Uh, when I was working in Afghanistan, I was training um, parliamentarians and I was training national political party leaders during the run-up to the parliamentary elections in 2005. And as, as I was training them on how to have campaigns, the national political party leaders were listening to this class and one of them raised their hand and very respectfully said, why do we have to have these platforms and these and, and tell the public wh what we think about issues. They should elect us and then they will know what we think. And that was very telling because it goes to that idea that sometimes going back to human nature, there are people who hold political office because they feel that they, have, they are more qualified. Uh, there's an elitist mentality, an us and them mentality. And people should never accept that. It's, it's servant leadership has always been the vision of our founding vision of, of our country's government is servant leadership. You serve the people and the people pay your salary for that service for that term, not a lifetime bureaucrat and not a lifetime politician making decisions um, and, and growing the size of government every year. So that's that's an important distinction too. You know, it's, it's super important. I think, especially as we we know sometimes inherently that there's so much opportunity in this country to be really to understand those foundational differences that yield such prosperity. Another question we had, Stephanie, is why should I trust the big businessman uh, more than the politician? Wow, that's a great question. Especially now, it's so timely because. We have this issue of big tech and a lot of big technology. The founders have become, they've enriched themselves greatly and wealthier than ever during the pandemic when a lot of businesses were going under. So I, I, I think this is a concern. Um, part of the issue is really understanding, yes, there's government. That is the role of government, to what degree is the role of government to get involved with private business and partner, right? Public-private partnership sounds good. There may be good uses for it, but there is a danger to that as well. If your civil rights are being undermined, we've seen a lot of censorship in the last year, uh, a lot of censorship of people who are completely deplatformed, right? 
So you're in this area where technology now has power over your life and, in, and also even your livelihood. There are people whose online stores were deplatformed, right? For whatever, for different reasons. So we do have to start thinking about the degree to which we yoke ourselves is the word that comes to mind, but the degree to which we depend upon big business, big government, the solutions, and I, I don't like to sound like a broken record, but they really are true. The solutions lie in the power of the individual, in localized government, in localized solutions, and in mutual benefit. So, so if the relationship is voluntary, in a free society, you want the relationship to be voluntary and you want it to be a mutual, mutually beneficial exchange. Right. When we look at big technology right now, and a lot of, uh, to, the, to the viewer's question, where is their mutual benefit right now, right? Is there mutual benefit there? If, if I'm told what I can say on a platform, I'm told what I can sell, um, I'm not allowed to, to be who I want to be and express myself, then there isn't mutual benefit there anymore. And that's a relationship then that maybe I should rethink. The hard part is it's very difficult if you become so reliant on something like technology, for example. So we have to really think about that because we're still free to associate with the businesses that we want to support and to not associate with the businesses we don't want to support. And we need to actually take that as a responsibility. Yeah, I, I think that that's such an important concept about mutual benefit. Uh, a lot of folks, um, yeah, look, a, a private business owner is going to be successful when they offer a product or a service that makes my life better. And if it's not, then, then Stephanie's right. I disengage. I don't, I don't deal with that person. It's tougher to do now with technology, of course. But, but e even so, um, the power that a business owner wields is, is, is very specialized. It's, it's very niche. As opposed to a, a, a president, which has immense power, or a governor who has immense power. Um, I can't leave the United States. I can probably leave a state. But um, still, the scope of, of, of what they can control uh, and the kind of power that they have, it doesn't compare to, to a business owner to begin with. Um, and I, I think this, the, the scale of things is something that it goes for, I, it, it's th that relationship um, has existed for thousands of years. I mean, if you go back to the Iliad, um, Achilles was actually upset at Agamemnon because he took something that he merited, apparently. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's very interesting when government takes from what you have earned, you know, people get angry. Uh, uh, and uh, the problem is that government has the power, uh, uh, the coercive power uh, to do that if, if, if we um, cede it, that kind of power. And so our instinct should be to reclaim that power and give it back to the individual, uh, decentralize. Um, and we do that with a business owner by ceasing that relationship by not buying from them, period. Yep. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel and Stephanie. This has been a very rewarding conversation. And um, like we've said, the Libre Institute really does is founding on that principle that freedom is what drives progress. And so we're thankful to shine a light on on a term that sometimes gets a little bit uh, politicized more than understood as to why it's not just a bad word, but a really bad idea. And so thank you for uh, for this. Uh, I also wanted to, before I hand it back to Daniel for the conclusion, wanted to thank our translators, uh, especially Damaris, who has been able to simultaneously bring this um, content to our Spanish speaking listeners. Thank you, Yvette. Uh, terrific. Uh, look, I, I'm, I'm just honored uh, that we can have these kind of conversations, especially with folks um, who are um, so distinguished, um, like uh, Stephanie. Uh, and we really appreciate your participation and contribution, Stephanie. And, and we look forward, obviously, to con you know, continued conversations uh, and dialogues around these important issues, like I said, on issues that impact our very daily lives. Have a good night.